What's up, my brothers? We're at the 700,000 subscriber Q&A. That's right, we made it. <laughs> I've got like three pages worth of questions here that I'm gonna answer that people posted on the community tab. So thank you for your queries and uh, requests for topics to sort of like deal with on this q and I'm gonna have my editor in the bottom in the timeline stamp all the uh, questions so you guys can jump back and forth as you wish. So let's get right into this. I know this is gonna take a bit. So first question we got here is for someone that wants to have a family in this day and age, what is your recommendation for realistically going about that and best avoiding the traps of this divorce machine? This is a very interesting question that comes up quite often. And I think it deserves really like an entire Unplugged Alpha podcast, you know, if I'm being honest to answer. But the shorter version is going to be, you need to be incredibly careful as a guy today. Everything in family law is stacked up against you. It is very low reward and high risk for men and very high reward and low risk for women, provided that they don't marry a total loser, which women generally tend to do. Like they tend to marry across and up on the socioeconomic scale. So it's not often that they find themselves in a predicament where they've married into uh, a guy's life who happens to be a bum. They're usually better off than she is. So for a guy, they have to be really, really careful because um, she gets bored seven to 10 years down the road, wants to untie the knot, you've got a few kids. Uh, she's been staying at home, maybe even planning it for a few years in advance to untie the knot. It can be very, very costly. So having a prenup and a postnup is always a good idea if you're well off. If you're not, it doesn't really matter if you're on the same level with uh, her. Having yourself situated in a province or state that is friendly towards fathers is ideal as well. I have a guy right now that I'm coaching who works for one of the fan companies that say, so Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, like that sort of stuff. Engineer makes lots of really good money. He lives in a state right now that's very hostile towards fathers and he's got a very domineering, overbearing wife. So what he's doing is he's actually, uh, his strategy is to move to a state that's friendlier towards fathers so he doesn't have to deal with fighting for custody, which is one of the things he knows he's gonna have to do. So being intentional about it, in where you live is very important too, I think. And you can check uh, National Parents Organization, the website every year. They have a report card ranking all the states in the U.S. as far as which ones are father friendly and which ones really hate you as a, a man. I think as of right now, at the time of recording, the top ones are going to be uh, Kentucky, Florida, Michigan, and California, believe it or not. Although California has hostile alimony laws, so there's, you know... <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. You're taking on a great deal of risk. I think the most important thing, setting aside those few points that I've just mentioned, is vetting the right woman. It is really, really important to pick mother stock correctly if uh, a family is what you're looking for. Because I didn't hear children, because you can do that with surrogacy, you don't need a mom for that. But if you're talking family in the conventional sense where it's mom, dad, and the kids in the household, you need a good uh, woman, good wife stock. Best way to do that is to vet them up against my 21 red flags for my book. You don't even need the book to do that. You can just opt into my email list and download it for free. So you can download the PDF once you opt in. That's pinned below. If you haven't uh, taken a look at that, I would recommend starting with the red flag chapter. The fewer to no red flags she has, the better off and the higher probability that you're gonna have a successful long-term relationship with that girl. Next question, how to overcome losing somebody you care for very deeply, a family member you put in brackets, distractions work uh, temporarily, can you suggest any long-term solution? I honestly don't have a good answer for this, uh, my friend. I um, I lost a close fa family member a few years ago during the uh, scamdemic, uh, basically due to, let's just say, the medical field's malpractice and use of tested items that they knew weren't good for uh, people, human beings. Anyway, long story short, um, you know, we lost this family member. It was incredibly painful for a lot of the uh, family for quite a long period of time because they were very, very important to the family. There's no get it like quick fix, like pop this pill and you know, you'll forget about them in seven days sort of thing. It, it, it's just a matter of time heals all wounds. Um, you know, you're talking about distractions. Distractions can be useful. There's certain things, you know, mindfulness that can be productive as well. You know, whether it's meditating, whether you take on something uh, like psilocybin trip, like a hero's trip, like a full on um, way to deal with uh, trauma. Some people seek therapy. I'm not a big fan of therapy. I think a lot of therapists um, don't really provide a ton of value, especially now that the uh, APA has basically told all therapists to treat men like they're toxically masculine. It is what it is. But definitely keeping yourself occupied so that you're not sitting there, um, you know, crying about it all the time. And 
you're going to have to go through the uh, tears. You know, you're going to have to shed the tears. You're going to have to go through the pain and the suffering. It's just a reality of being a human. You know, we get the benefits of life, but we also have to deal with the uh, consequences of, you know, what happens when life ends, whether it's uh, abrupt or sudden, you know, car accidents, um, unknown disease, or some people live, you know, very long lives. It's just one of those things you got to you got to deal with and I haven't found an easy way of, of dealing with it aside from giving it time appreciating them for what they were who they were you know for you and then letting go there has to be the letting go phrase you know there has to be like the okay they're gone now right you have to come to the surrendering of I'm never gonna see this person again and that's it and you can deal with that as you see best but grieve and then definitely make sure that you get to the let go phase next question if you could live overseas where are three countries you would strongly consider to make your home base so i've talked about wanting to get out of canada in the future as you can see it's a winter time here and it's a very dreary gray day in fact we have not seen much sun at all this winter it's, it's been it's been either cold rainy or or some combination of cold rainy and, and cloudy um, the tax rates here are ridiculous. I don't see the country moving in a very positive direction. So I've said many times in other videos and in podcasts and interviews that I've done that I'm planning an exit. Um, that's not happening immediately. I have obligations here to uh, family and my kid. And uh, that's going to take a few years to sort of um, make sure that that unravels and everything's uh, as it needs to be. But my plan is really to spend time most of the year outside of Canada in a place that has much more favorable weather, has the opportunity to incorporate myself or my business or a combination of both in a lower to no tax uh, region. And I think probably English speaking is going to be high on the priority of that list because I don't really feel like learning a new language. So I, I haven't decided where that's going to be. I've been kind of doing a little bit of a walkabout quietly over the last few years, traveling, uh, checking out different parts of the world. Um, areas that I feel tick off those boxes that will give me the opportunity to go where I'm actually treated better and um, you know valued and I don't get bent over and have my wealth stolen from me in the form of taxation because believe it or not there are places in the world that don't take half of your income and use it for <laughs> things that I don't agree with uh, there are places in the world where you don't have to do that so I've got my eyes open for some of those opportunities I'll definitely announce it on the channel I mean as long as I'm doing YouTube I will share exactly what I'm up to with you guys and here's the other thing too that you gotta remember right even if something looks good right now it may not be good in you know four to six years down the road legislative uh, policies can change laws can change uh, taxes can increase uh, they don't usually decrease but taxes can increase so it's not always a, a fixed target i think it's more of a moving target and being a man of the world and having multiple passports so you have options next question what's the most underrated business nuance or aspect that you think is overlooked by many without a doubt hands down i will say it again being a good problem solver. Guys today aren't very good at solving their problems. They're not good at solving problems in their own life, financially, with women, with relationships, with making money, with creating wealth, even doing things simple like, hey, you know, can you learn combat skills? You know, people will find ways to complicate their life and justify why they're not doing these things. Without a doubt, being an excellent problem solver is what's required especially in the entrepreneurial realm of things and in life, you need to be able to solve problems because that's all that running a business really is, is a sequence of problems that comes at you over and over again from different angles and there are different problems trying to derail you from your goal. And I've said this many, many times, you know, you're either going to find a solution to that problem or you're going to find an excuse as to why you didn't solve that problem. So you're either going to win or you're going to lose. Winners win, losers lose. So get really good at solving problems in your life. Solve problems everywhere you possibly can. This isn't something that school teaches us. School does not teach us to think outside of the box. And in many cases, it's even better to not even see the box to find a remedy to the problem that you're dealing with. So become a good outside of the box thinker at the very least, or even better, don't even see the box when it comes to thinking and coming to solutions. But solving problems is incredibly important and most people aren't good at it because we've all been taught color within the lines, cross your T's, dot your I's, do exactly what they tell you to do. And that's not really working out for us too well now, is it? Next question. I saw you had the founder of the X3 bar on a while ago. You would try it out to see what you thought of it. Never saw a video about your experience using it. I could have missed something. Anyways, what did you think of it compared to standard weight training methods? Good question. So 
if you're not familiar with that system, it's basically rubber bands. So it's a straight bar. It's um, bands that you can swap out on the hooks of the straight bar. And depending on what exercise you're doing, usually a, uh, a plate that you stand on that the bands go under. So as you do things like curls or squats or deadlifts or shoulder presses, the bands become increasingly more difficult to move as you stretch them out. The good thing with them, I found, is it's very difficult to injure yourself just because of the progressive nature of the overload. And, and as you get towards the end of the movement up here, it's not like, like if I'm standing and I'm, and I'm curling up, it's not likely that I'm gonna create an injury at this part of the movement where there's the most tension. It's usually right at the bottom where I've seen guys like disconnect a bicep on like a bicep curl machine because it's right like this and you're extended and then you just start curling it and then that's where you run into problems. So the good news is, is I find that it's very safe or it's, it's better for those that are more injury prone. If you're older, I think, if you're dealing with some sort of recovery issue from a surgery, probably good from that. But if you want to look big and muscular and aesthetically strong, I don't think you're going to get that. Um, you're never going to get that from bands, in my opinion. If I had to go to one thing, it's probably going to be dumbbells. Um, nothing tied into a machine, bars, cables, or anything like that, just dumbbells. Uh, whether it's pressing, shoulders, uh, chest, curls, tricep extension, any number of things. Um, it's a good accessory. It's probably good if you're traveling. It's better than not having anything at all, but weights, in my opinion, are still the go-to gold standard. Next question. I'm currently earning uh, six figures and in good shape. However, to maintain this, I'm working 12-hour days, six days a week. I'm up at 6.30, out the door at 7 a.m. I work from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., home just before 9, then 45 minutes in the gym, shower, back to bed at 11, the one day off a week is used to get myself organized for the following week, so washing clothes, food shopping, general chores, responsibilities. This means my game with women is suffering massively. I literally don't have the time to go on dates. The only female interaction I have is maybe the girl behind the counter when I'm grabbing my coffee or lunch. I find women lose interest because I don't have time to text them constantly throughout the day. It's like they want you instantly available 247, yeah. Uh, and if they don't get it, they'll just drop you and move on to the guy that is. My question is, would you recommend I stop working so much, which means I will be down a significant amount of money and scale back on the gym sessions in order to free up some time to work on my game and dating women? So that's dependent on a few things. You said six figures. Six figures could be $100,000 a year or that could be $900,000 a year. If you're doing all of this with the amount of hours that you're working with no free time to do anything in your entire life at all right now, I'm going to say $100,000 ain't worth it. If one to three years down the road, you're projected to make a lot more than $100,000 and you're going to have more time, then I would say that is probably worth it. If you're making $999,000, this is probably more important than chasing any kind of tail. That being said, if you want to have a family and you want to have children sort of thing and you're feeling like you're 35, 40 and you want to start, you know, scattering your seed and uh, leaving behind a legacy, you're not going to be able to vet a chick properly working these kinds of hours. You're going to need more spare time to see what she's made of, date her, date other women simultaneously in a non-monogamous fashion, let the cream rise to the top. As the cream rises to the top and they start saying, hey, where do we stand? Where is this going? Maybe you start to take them more seriously. Maybe you do it monogamously. Maybe you don't do it monogamously. Maybe you're going to start doing some traveling to see what happens when the luggage gets lost, if she loses her shit, to see what she's made of. There's a lot of things to contemplate here, but um, I think chase excellence, not women, is again one of the core tenets, one of the core phrases you'll hear me repeat over and over again until I'm blue in the face. I'm never going to change it. It is the most important thing. Now, if there's other things that start to trump that, Again, like I said earlier, you wanna have kids. Well, you're gonna need to vet mother stock if you want a family. And the other thing too is I would not be doing this kind of shit over a very long period of time. If you're working these number of hours with very, very little spare time, I mean, what are you doing? You're getting up to go line some dude's pocket with gold that's becoming filthy rich from your labor probably. Uh, you're paying taxes to buy things that you don't really care about to impress people that don't even know that you exist really at the end of the day. There's nobody that's ever laid down on their deathbed and been like, yeah, you know, I wish I would have worked more. You know, I was only working these hours over here. You know, I could have squeezed in an extra 45 minutes if I didn't go to the gym, you know, sort of thing. Nobody ever regrets like spare time, having time that's useful, you know, for your own uh, passion projects, you know, your own things. 
So you're going to have to size it up for yourself. I, I don't like this over a very long-term basis for not a lot of money. If it's turning into a lot of money later on down the road, like you're going to climb some, some, uh, some obstacles and some steps, maybe something big is, you know, coming down three or five years down the road, then it's probably worth doing this, you know, to sacrifice a little bit of time. If you're in your twenties, for sure. If you're in your forties or something like that, you may not contemplate that. So there's a few things to evaluate there, but it's a great question. I just, again, what it boils down to me is lying on my deathbed. Am I going to sit there regretting not working more? Right. Oh I, oh, I wish I kept working. I, you know, I wish I worked 120 hours uh, every two weeks instead of 80 hours or whatever it happens to be. The whole point of working should be buying you freedom. And I don't think it's good if you're not getting the freedom that you want, unless you absolutely passionately adore what you're doing every single day, which I didn't hear here. Next question. For a young man who hasn't upgraded his vehicle, what's an affordable upgrade that is worthwhile or is not upgrading a better option? was thinking about getting a used Dodge Challenger only for a V6 for better uh, gas mileage and insurance costs. For a young guy with a lower price point vehicle, exhaust all day long. Um, I can start this up and maybe just warm up the engine a little bit. But this car does have an exhaust. I've done a lot of work to this car. I'll, I'll do a separate video one day on why I like to build it instead of buy it. But intake exhaust software, all this sort of stuff. You can just hear the exhaust, right? It's it's enough to hear. And the cool thing about exhaust, in my opinion, is it's it's nice bang for the buck because you get a little bit of a power bump, you get a nice, you know, throaty sound to it. I'm not a huge fan of um, like the cheap muscle car. Um, you know, when I was a kid, we had the V6 Camaros, the four bang or Mustangs, and you had like the look of the muscle car but with the shitty engine with not a lot of performance for fuel economy or, or insurance reasons. When I think of muscle car, I want Hemi in it. I want uh, Hemi with a blower, supercharger, stack superchargers, turbo supercharger. I want all the shit, man. I want hardcore, you know, put your head in the back of the seat when you accelerate power. Looking like that, but only having a V6 for fuel economy or for insurance reasons. I mean, not my thing, might be some people's thing. They obviously sell those cars for some reason. I see mostly, you know, women driving them, if I'm being honest, or people that can't afford the V8. So, you know, to your, to your prior question where you're like, is not upgrading a better option? I mean, if you want the Hemi, then I would work my ass off until you get the Hemi, right? If that's what you want, if you want the muscle car. Otherwise, it's not a muscle car with a V6 or a four banger, in my opinion, anyway. Next question. Girl I've been dating for two months who regularly talks to an ex-boss. He's a married, influential person, he puts, uh, working for a major tech company. Today, she called him to see if she could get a discount on a brand new phone she wanted to buy, and the guy just sent it for free. I don't really like it. Is that a red flag? Look, this is how women are today. They're going to commit to you in a relationship. You know, hey, Rich, I'm your girlfriend. Cool. But if she can't afford the phone and I can't afford to buy her the phone, then she's going to try to find ways to weasel it out so that she can get it either at a discount or she's going to play the damsel in distress and maybe get it for free, which in this case is what happened. You don't like that because you know that she's leaning on another guy who's of higher status. You mentioned influential and he works for a major tech company. I'm assuming he probably sent her a brand new, you know, $2,000 iPhone. I don't know what they cost, but let's just say it's an iPhone or something like that. Cause that's, you know, seems to be what women go for. Yeah. I could get why you're upset. Um, if you're 40, then that's more of a problem. But if you're like 22 sort of thing and you're a young man and she's a young gal, it's kind of expected, man. It's kind of expected that if you're not able to, you know, to do this, she's going to find it somewhere else. Um, I'm not saying that it, it's, it's something that you could, sh that you should control more, that you should exert more frame around. But at the end of the day, her going there to try to get free stuff from another guy, it's always going to bother you. That's never going to change. So what's the answer to that? You either buy her the stuff, you make more money, or she makes more money and buys her own stuff. Or the third option is really, you set a boundary on it. You say, look, stop talking to married guys and trying to, you know, whittle some free stuff out of them or, or discounted stuff out of them, right? That's another way to handle it. But 
I get why that's an awkward one for, for you. Next question, what are your top three best pieces of advice for someone starting a YouTube channel today? Ooh, interesting question. So consistency is always gonna be key. I was talking to Dr. Orion Taraban when I had him on my podcast, uh, I don't know, it was like in the last 10 months or something like that. And he said I had committed to doing weekly videos, I believe it was almost for two years you know, at that point to see if I had traction. And it took pretty much two years for the algorithms to say, huh, this is interesting. Let's show this to more people. And then subscribers started to grow and views started to grow. That's just how YouTube works. It's very rare that you'll put time in and it'll just blow up. You know, these overnight successes that are legit overnight successes are very, very rare. Almost every single overnight success that you'll find on YouTube took years and years. Like for me, I started the channel in 2014. It was May 23rd, 2014. I remember the date because it was a May 2-4 weekend, the Victoria Day weekend. We were out at a retreat uh, with some other entrepreneurs. And I said, let's grab this GoPro, make a quick video on my buddy's uh, Ram 1500 pickup truck. You can go back to the channel and sort it out to see the uh, first video. So the, the overnight success of entrepreneurs in cars was basically 10 years as well too, right? The first few years were very, very slow. It wasn't until something got picked up in the algorithms that it really blew up the channel and I got a lot a lot more traction and subscriber count started to grow. So the consistency part is really, really important. You need to get clear on whether you're not whether you're going to entertain or educate. Mr. Beast is an entertainment channel. There's other education channels out there which are interesting. The other thing too is I would say keep the production simple. People don't want highly, it's not Hollywood, this is YouTube. I'm, I'm sitting here in my car in a parking lot, having my Americano, reading my Q&A. People are going about their world around me. This is not highly produced. There's no lighting guy, there's no sound guy. There's none of that shit. It's just me in my car with a GoPro. So you don't need to overproduce it. I think one of the big mistakes guys make is they'll go out and spend a whack ton of money or they'll hire videographers and sound engineers and all this stuff and editors and it's like, you'll notice my videos are very simple. They're jump cuts. The content is what people come back for. It's not the quality of the production. Obviously the quality of production is very, very basic. So delivering top shelf content and not over engineering it. So I think those would be the main, main piece of advice that I would give you. Next question. My workouts feel better one to one and a half hours after I have sex. Is it pure psychology or is there science to it? I'm gonna guess you're a young man. Uh, Cause as a young man at, at one point in my life, um, I get that you could just go to the gym, bang, go to the gym, like in that sequence, whatever number of times you wanted, like, you know, six, seven, eight times a day, it doesn't really matter. So whether or not you're talking about psychology or science to it, I'm, I'm going to give neither to it. I'm going to give youth to it. Um, as you get older, as long as you're taking care of your cardiovascular health and you're eating well, and you're not like, you're checking your blood markers for inflammation, having sex and doing things when you're older is not a problem at all. It's just not preferable. I'm not going to have a good workout or if I go to the dojo to fight after a sesh in the bedroom. It's just not productive. In, in my estimation, I wanna do those sorts of workouts early in the morning when I've got the energy, I can meet up with my trainer, uh, you know, I'm fresh, um, you know, I'm just ready to go sort of thing. So <laughs> it's an interesting question, but hey, you know, you guys ask questions, I'll answer whatever I think from my angle. Next question, what's your take on Canadian immigration? All right, immigration as a whole. I'm gonna say immigration as a whole for this one because at the time of recording this, there's an issue in the States with people, re refugees walking across the border, mostly in uh, Texas. Um, they're fighting back and forth with that between the state and the federal government. Um, I've learned that the vast majority of the people walking across the border, some are even flying in, believe it or not, the government's paying to fly them in from different ports of entry because walking across the border makes it so congested and difficult. I'm also told they're being handed an envelope with $10,000 cash and also being given free healthcare. Now they're not all Latin refugees walking across the border at this point, as I understand it. There's many coming from China, from India, from Africa, from all over the world. It's just, it's easier for them to fly into Latin America than walk across that border. That's not a good thing. The numbers that I've been given are anywhere from 20 to 25,000 per day. I don't know if that's consistent daily or if there's uh, you know spurts of that, but that's a lot. You do the numbers on that, plus the amount of money that they're uh, printing out and sticking in envelopes given to these uh, people, you're talking into the billions of dollars. It's a lot of new immigration and it's 
it's similar here. It's just they're not walking across the Texas-Mexican border and coming up to Canada. They're basically declaring refugee status uh, at the ports of entry. My family's an a immigrant family to Canada. We came from the United Kingdom. I was born there. I was a little kid at the time. You know, my family moved here. There was due process. There was a port of entry. You didn't just walk across. Um, borders were defended. I don't think that's true today anymore. I think that there's that there's a, a very wide open policy. Just come if you feel like it. It's the same thing in Europe too. People on dinghy boats just going from Africa to Italy, from uh, France to the UK. Um, claiming asylum, refugee status, uh, getting free handouts, they're not making contributions to the tax system. Uh, many don't even have, you know, like usable skills um, that that can contribute. Um, it, was, it was expected when my family immigrated that there was some use that was going to be contributed. Like, did you have some money that you're gonna bring in and set up into a Canadian bank account? Uh, what skills do you have? What degrees do you have? What languages do you speak? Like they were very specific about placement. Like when my grandmother came to Canada uh, on my mom's side, she was mostly French speaking, so they put her in Quebec. When my family came from the UK to, to Canada, English speaking, so they put us in Toronto. Uh, today it's like, doesn't matter. You don't speak the language. You don't, you know, whatever. It, it, it's cool. Come on in and, you know, we'll give you some free stuff and we'll, and we'll figure it out later. I think that's going to backfire. Not today, not any time in the very near future, but I think as time goes on and these numbers start to compound and they're not being careful about vetting the people that they're walking in. Like if you can just walk across the border and say, I'm a refugee, give me some free shit. And they don't do a background check. They don't ID check you. They don't know what you've been up to. And keep in mind, the vast majority of these people um, are essentially uh, military age males. Uh, it's not a lot of women and children. It's mostly males that are making this uh, journey. So, I mean, you you tell me in the comments whether you think it's going to end well or if it's going to end badly. I'm going to err on the badly side as, as time goes on. Next question. What's your recommended hobby that betters yourself and can also make friends? This is, this is interesting because I say this so many times on my YouTube channel. Learn how to fight, go to a dojo, pick something. Is it gonna be sparring, boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, jujitsu, right? Are you gonna roll? I don't care. I've not met a single loser that goes to a fighting gym in my life. They might start off as softer, weaker, meeker sort of uh, males that, that haven't really accomplished much or learned very many skills, but as they spend more time in there and develop and the years go in they get better and better and their confidence improves and they become more and more useful um those are really good people the really good people that i found in dojos uh, i wish i would have found this earlier in my life i wish my parents would have told me to do this because all i got from my parents is boy scouts and you know like the random paper route that i was told to start when i was young and then i started working in part-time jobs but i think if you're a young guy or even a even a youth uh even a guy in your 20s and you haven't learned any of these skills yet, go to a dojo and learn how to fight. Really good people there, really useful skills, great cardiovascular activity. Uh, shit hits the fan. It's something that you can use. Women are very attracted to men that have um, the capacity to wield violence. I talk about it in one of the chapters of my book. Um, I, I'm guessing you haven't read my book, so check it out. That's pinned below in the description. Learn. Next question, what's your relationship status, Rich? Can we trust a girl who showed some hint that she loves money and status and regret showing it forward, then confess later? So, so you're talking about gold digging, basically. Well, I've said this before, I'm in a, a long-term relationship, non-cohabitating, so we don't live together. I just think it's better that way. I've talked about it in videos. There's a video on my channel, don't live with a woman that you love. You know, you can go look it up. As far as your question about, can you trust a girl who showed a hint that she loves money and status? I, I don't think you can trust a girl that doesn't show a hint of loving money and status. It's innate in them. Women want a guy that has money and status. Any woman that says, I don't care if he has money and status, or I'm not interested in his ability to solve problems, uh, be influential, have financial resources, is lying. I would think that she is more of a liar than one that's at least honest about it. So why hide it? Um, you just have to protect yourself from any sort of problems that may arise from a gold digger. And there are women that are worse than others, obviously, but I don't think that um, I would trust a girl that that declared openly that she doesn't like money or status. To me, there's something real fishy about that. All women will express interest in a guy of high status and of success monetarily as well. 
the, you're never going to get away from that. I mean, how do you solve that problem? Build status and make bank, right? Next question. What do you think is the best mentality personality to get business slash dating? Should you be more dominant, more charming, seductive, even funny, light spirited? What gives the best results? Or do you think it's a combination? Uh, you seem to be a person always calm, collected and strong, a great role model, but there's also guys that seem to always be happy, doing jokes, charming, and also have results on money and dating. What's better? What's the best mindset to approach girls? More direct or more seductive like gay? Okay, this is a very long question with a whole bunch of question marks at the end of it. Uh, there's a chapter in my book on the seven spokes of a high value man. You need to read my book. Clearly you haven't read it because I answer that question. It's, it, it's in the second edition. Uh, so again, that's pinned below in the description. Uh, you want all seven spokes with equal weighting or as, or as equal a weighting as you can get in all the areas. So for example, if you max out in money and all you have is money, then you're only ever going to lead with your wallet. If you're out of shape, if you're not masculine, if you don't have uh, combat skills, uh, if you're not influential, like if you're boring and rich with nothing going on and fat and you're out of shape, nobody looks up to you, you're invisible, it's, you know, you're just going to leave with your wallet and that's all that she's going to want from you. So you want all seven spokes in as equal proportion as possible. Read that chapter in my book so it makes sense because it'll take me an hour to explain it all. Next question. Any tips on how to maintain frame with a younger mid-20s girl as an older guy? He says, I'm in early 40s. She comes from a wealthy family and is used to a certain lifestyle that I know I can't afford. Okay. So she's with you not because of money, because her family has money. So maybe that's one itch that her family's being able to take care of is um, taking care of whatever financial needs she wants. So that leaves me with, well, why is she with you? I think the answer to that question is that there's a contingent of women out there that just have a stronger preference for seasoned gentlemen. Guys that are older, that have some salt and pepper in their beard, they have some wisdom. Wisdom comes with experience, obviously, it comes with age. Probably somewhere between 20 to 25% of women out there just have a stronger preference for an older guy. That doesn't mean that you have to be older and rich. She just has a preference for you. If you're older and rich, and influential and competent and you've got combat skills and you know all that sort of stuff that i talk about the seven spokes of a high value man now you've got the whole package now you're pretty much irresistible to a chick that has a preference for older more seasoned guys with some wisdom so if you're not scratching the itch for money then you're obviously scratching the itch just for the seasoned guy i hope you're able to scratch the itch in the bedroom because you're gonna have to be able to take care of that one of the problems that a lot of guys deal with as they get older, their cardiovascular health isn't looked after, they're not on top of their blood labs, they're not staying on top of testosterone and hormone levels, and they let that sort of stuff falter and they're not able to perform in the bedroom. They might have issues, you know, going on between, you know, their ears, you know, the meatball on their head that's holding them back. So if you're an older guy that's not wealthy, you better be an older, good looking guy that knows how to deal with the bedroom fund. Because if she's getting the money situation scratched by the family, then you have to take care of the other things. The other critical mistake that I see a lot of guys make a lot of the time is they try to enter into her world, right? So if she likes certain types of music or certain types of fashion or style, these guys will then adopt her musical interests or fashion and style interests. And that's not the way to do it. She doesn't want you to enter her world. She wants to enter your world. So invite her into it. You know, I say this many times, you have to be captivating. You have to be an interesting guy as you get older. You know, it's the whole Dos Equis guy, right? Like the most interesting man in the world was the Dos Equis guy. He was seasoned, you know, mostly uh, salty sort of beard and hair surrounded by beautiful women. Um, that That's factual, you know, it's true. So being an older guy that's got all seven spokes is the ideal way to go. But again, always invite her into your world. You do not want to go into her world. That won't work out longer term. Next question. If you start making money early, should you invest in stocks and stuff or invest 50% in yourself and 50% in fun and memories? I had somebody ask me one time, how would you invest $5,000? And I made a video about it. So I'll put a card up on the top right because I explain exactly what I would do in a scenario like that. So you should watch that video after this one. But essentially, you're going to take the five grand and you're going to invest it in yourself. Uh, I cover multiple ways to do that to get the best ROI because really putting $5,000 in some sort of investment fund is not going to turn it into a million dollars or $10 million or anything like that. You might be lucky in your lifetime if you invest that and stack on top of that to turn it into something that's six figures, maybe into seven figures over 20 years if you go slowly into it. I think the best investment would 
be to follow exactly what I talk about in that video. And again, card at the top right. Next question, prediction of the dating scene in 10 years. Well, having been watching the dating scene throughout my entire life evolve, which went from no online presence whatsoever where you actually had to call a girl's house. You'd have to get her phone number, call a girl's house, usually in high school, her mom or dad would answer and you'd ask, hey, is so-and-so there? Can I talk to him? And they'd be like, who the hell's calling my house? And you'd have to identify yourself. And then you'd talk to her and try to figure out how to seduce or flirt with her, mostly in a very awkward or anxious sort of way. Today, we have Lots of information out there. Most of it you can get for free. Some of it's organized well in some courses and material like that. But at the end of the day, you know, the information age is upon us. You can get information about anything you want when it comes to dating. So that's a strong improvement. On the downside, women have more options than ever before in their entire life. And they're using it for nefarious reasons, i.e. OnlyFans. They're using uh, dating apps for attention and validation from simps. Hey, you know, we matched on here. You look nice. Hey, you should sign up for my OnlyFans. There's a discount code. You can get it for only $6.99 a month. And waves of these dorks, all of these simps, are going in and throwing, you know, their monthly subscriptions to OnlyFans models, I put in quotations, because most of them are actually average at best. But women have an overly uh, entitled sense of self-worth. They think that they're more valuable, they're more beautiful, they're more attractive than what they are, because all they have to do is post a couple of, you know, decently edited photographs, sometimes with filters, lots of makeup and stuff like that, push-up bras, and then they too can also get all the attention and validation they want from guys. So the thing that is not understood very well is that women think that there's loads and loads of very successful high-value men just hiding from them somewhere, and the vast majority of men are not that who are all competing for what look like attractive women, which are mostly trash because they've been around the block so much. So promiscuity will continue to go up, meaning men and women will be sharing their bodies with each other more than ever. The men that will be doing best on the sexual marketplace will be the highest value ones because they'll be the ones spoiled for choice. And the women that are also gonna be the most valuable ones in the sexual marketplace are gonna be the ones that preserve their value. Again, men need to do something with their lives they have to create something out of themselves. They have to go out there and put some little dent in the universe. They have to do the work and turn themselves into something. Women just need to preserve their value. Those are the two key components. The more women that do that and the more men that do this, the better it is for the sexual marketplace. We have less men becoming valuable, you know, doing something with their life. They're just sitting around doing a lot of the time nothing or just, you know, being themselves because their single mom told them, just be yourself, be a nice guy. And you have women uh, who are rarer and rarer when it comes to preserving their value. They're sharing their body more and more. So things are going to become more difficult. If you want to be spoiled for choice, if you want options, become a high value man. Read the chapter in my book on the seven spokes of a high value man and understand that a little bit better. Next question, uh, go to where you're treated best. Do you think this advice also applies to women? Why or why not? I mean, look, you can go to places in the world where, we're, where we've been told you'll be treated better by women. Places in Asia and Latin America. And there are guys that will go to these places where they end up dating, you know, Miss Columbia or, or Miss Panama. Or they'll meet, you know, who, who looks like a formidable, beautiful, compliant Asian woman, you know, for example. What ends up happening with most of these guys is they discover that women aren't sugar and spice and all things nice in other parts of the world. They're just looking like they're better options and they often can be better options for a short period of time but what ends up happening is if they bring them back to the west you're screwed because they're going to get drunk on the western kool-aid the toxic feminism the i don't need no man the boss girl hashtags that are out there and all those avatars if you stay there we've seen guys duped um most of the guys that end up going to these places in east you know like asia or in latin america for example they end up in a scenario where they get taken advantage of because they're nerds and they haven't learned game and they haven't uh, figured out what women respond to. They haven't done the work on themselves. They're out of shape. So yes, you might do better somewhere else. And again, you're leading with your wallet. If all you're going to do is lead with your wallet and your exchange rate, you'll do better for a little bit. But over time, you're probably going to get wrecked. So going to where you're treated best with women is a, a nice notion, it's a nice idea, but if you're not the best version of yourself, you're gonna run into problems regardless of where you live. Next question, should one focus on a passion or on making money? 
I've said that there's three areas that need to intersect if you want to create a nice business. Uh, passion is really important. It making money is really important, but you also need to be very good at it. If those three things don't intersect, like let's say that you're really good at it and you're passionate about it, but it doesn't make money, then all you have is a hobby, right? So if you want something that's got some legs, you need to be passionate about it. You love it. So you lose track of time when you're doing it. You make lots of money doing it means it throws off lots of cash and you're really good at it. And if those three things intersect, you're pretty much golden. That's where all the best entrepreneurs sort of plan. Next question. What can a guy do to stop craving female validation, especially if he's still in the process of improving his looks and finances to become high value individual and thus not receiving much female attention yet? Um, so if you're in your 20s and you're not influential and you're poor and you're trying to figure something out in your life, you should be in very good shape. Okay, you can still get female validation and attention if you're a Jack Chad or Tyrone or whatever in your early 20s. Um, that isn't enough as you get older. So I've always said women have a lot of patience for a young guy with a plan. So you can be a, a young hot dude that's got a plan for the rest of his life. She's got patience for that because she wants to see it unfold. If you're like 40 and you're broke and you you know, you're selling yourself as I've got a plan sort of thing. Women don't have as much patience for you. They kind of expect you to have figured out some stuff in life by then. And you show up with something, you know, to demonstrate that you've got some value. So as a younger guy, if you're, if you're craving, you know, female validation, but you're broke, you're, you don't have a good social network, be jacked, you know, learn how to fight basic, you know, like the fundamentals of masculinity, strength, and the optics of all of those things sort of combined will get you the girls. But again, all of these things should not be done for the girls. All of these things should be done for yourself so that you're spoiled for choice and have better options when it comes to the girls. So stop being a simp basically is what I mean. Stop craving, you know, the validation. Where do you see the future of OnlyFans and other alike websites, businesses going in the future? That's interesting. Okay, well, we know that sex is one of the oldest businesses in the world. Sex sells. Women like to get the acknowledgement and receive uh, compensation for it, whether it's pictures, whether it's photographs, videos, or an exchange, um, you know, person to person, that's that's the oldest business in the world. That's not gonna change. They're gonna find ways to modify that. You're gonna see newer versions of OnlyFans. You're gonna see it integrated possibly with robotics and AI, maybe women selling the likeness of themselves to a robotics company or AI so that nerds can get access to what they think is sexual access, but it's, uh, it's like an AI or it's a virtual version of it. I think you're gonna see stuff like that appear more and more in the future. We're not quite there yet, but it's coming. And like actual dating where people go out and they have a conversation and you know, hey, I'd like to see you again sort of thing. You're gonna see less and less of that. You're gonna see more of an economy where you're gonna see simps driving that economy and women looking for the attention and validation in exchange for resources for $9.99 a month or whatever it happens to be from these geeks that haven't done the work on themselves because they want access to women's attention and validation. So learn to become the best version of yourself, like I keep saying. Read my damn book, The Unplugged Alpha, and pay attention to the chapter on the seven spokes of a high-value man. Next question. Would you keep a woman that hasn't shown genuine burning desire for you in the past as a friends with benefits? So I'm assuming he's with a girl that he's intimate with, but she's not showing genuine burning desire, so he's thinking about transitioning the dating phase to an FWB. Okay, so here's the thing. There's a chapter in my book I talk about what genuine burning desire is. When a guy has it, he knows it. When you don't have it, you're going to know it as well because you're going to really struggle to get her attention. You're going to really struggle to have um, a strong connection and affection from her. She's going to be indifferent. She's going to cancel. She's going to flake on you. She's not going to show up. She's going to want to reschedule all of these things. And even if she's with you, you're probably going to be working harder than what it's generally worth. So it's my estimation that wasting your time on women that do not have genuine burning desire for you is not a good return on investment on your time as a guy. Why don't they have genuine burning desire? You're lacking somewhere. You're a dork. You're, you're, you're missing something or several things. Go back to the chapter on the seven spokes of a high value man and max out on all of those spokes. You'll have better opportunities. Chasing a gal that doesn't have genuine burning desire for you, it's too much work. 
In my estimation, it's not worth it. And realistically, at the end of the day, uh, you're talking about turning, I guess, a woman that you're dating into a friends with benefits. It's not likely that she's going to want to stick around and just be a sex object to you if she doesn't already have genuine burning desire. She either has it and is willing to be a sex object, or she doesn't have it, and she's not gonna be willing to do that. So I'm not really sure why you think you can turn her into a friends with benefits if she doesn't already have GBD for you. She actually has to have GBD to want to be intimate with you. Uh, if she doesn't, it's gonna turn into a transaction. It's gonna be, be my sugar daddy and give me an allowance of you know X amount of dollars per whatever month or whatever it happens to be. So. Always seek genuine burning desire from women. If you don't get it, move on is my is my advice. And you should have options to move on. If you don't have options to move on, it's because you haven't maxed out on the seven spokes. Start there. Next question. I'm the father of two young boys. Besides chess, what are good strategic games to play with your kids? Um, chess is a fantastic game. It's a little more advanced for small kids. I don't know how old they are. Um, you said young boys. Connect Four is a good starting place. I would start with Connect Four. It's strategic. It's easy to learn, good visuals, super easy game to play. Chess is even better. There's other you know, strategic games that you can play with kids. Uh, don't play dice games, like any game that relies on dice rolls to win. So for example, like an old board game, I think it's still around, it's called Risk. These are all dice games, you know, you roll a dice and it's like you battle and not, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, then you know you win the battle and you sort of like take over more land. So it might seem like a strategic game at first, but anything that relies on dice rolls or luck, uh, in my estimation, isn't strategic. It has to be thinking based and each thought has consequences downstream. Uh, again, Chess and Connect Four are really good starting points. Connect Four if they're younger. Next question, thoughts on AI taking people's jobs and potential universal basic income. I think, I'm gonna add robotics to that. So we're talking AI, robotics, and universal basic income. UBI is already here, okay? It's just not called universal basic income universally yet. There's a lot of money that's just being handed out. You know, walk across the border, here's some cash. Can't go to work because you've got anxiety about going to work, so you're gonna stay home because you're afraid of, uh, you know, a, a virus that 99.9% .9 of people survive if they get, no problem, we'll give you some money, you know. You know, can't get a job because whatever, here's some more money, right? So money is handed out. UBI pretty much already exists. It's just not called UBI and it's not given to any everybody. Universal basic income, by definition, is supposed to be handed out to everybody. So you get a basic, let's call it $2,500 a month, whether you're employed or unemployed, to sort of top you up. Um, we're, we're gonna get there. The government loves printing money. The more money they print, the more they can pass out, the more they can, uh, you know, claim taxation rules on things. You can also, with uh, central bank digital currencies, you can program the money that you're gonna pass out. So whether it's printed money or it's digital money that gets passed out as central bank digital currency, they can program the money. They can force you to spend it within a certain period of time so they can control your finances even further. To the other points of robotics and AI replacing jobs and putting people on UBI, yeah, you're gonna find a lot of very basic jobs that don't need human beings, corporations are going to make obsolete with either robotics or AI. Um, I talked about this before and there was a short that went viral when I was talking about McDonald's and other fast food chains, basically talking about making robotics uh, commonplace in you know their chains because your minimum wage keeps going up. The socialists keep wanting to drive up the rate because you know you got to earn a living wage, and that drives up inflation. That causes other problems. You got problems with employees. They don't show up for work. They call in sick. They're banging each other. You know they take time off. They want vacations. All kinds of things that you run into problems with employees. And let's be honest, for repeatable tasks, robots or AI are far more efficient than a human being. Human beings are not efficient at all with the amount of money that we spend. Uh, you know, to employ them. I know I've employed lots of people in my lifetime in my different businesses. I've got a, a, a Timmy's cup here. It says 60 on it. So I'm assuming, you know, 60 year anniversary. Um, but as you go into a Tim Hortons coffee shop, you can get sandwiches, donuts, coffees, and things like that. All of these things, I can go to a counter right now. Like the technology exists. I can go to a counter, scan some barcode or not even scan anything. Just, you know, I can put on my phone on an app. I want this, this, and this and walk in 
basically robots will spit it out. It'll probably have my name on it. And then it's already charged my credit card that's on file. And they don't need to have all those people in there. They never call in sick. They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, very efficiently. Everything's always made perfectly. Like I go to, you know, the Tim's and half the time when I ask for like an Americano with some cream in it, they forget to put the cream in it, right? Um, a robot can be programmed to do exactly what it's been told to do, repeatable, straightforward things. It's not complex. Human beings are flawed in that sense, and they screw things up. So, yes, you're going to see corporations adopt more robotics, more AI, uh, anything that can be automated or turned into an algorithm that's more efficient with those terms will send people home, which means people are going to be sitting around doing nothing, twiddling their thumbs, taking some sort of government handout to pay for their basic needs. You're not going to be getting free money from the government in the regard where you're going to be able to afford a supercar, an exotic, a yacht. You know, that's not how UBI works. It's basic income. So to have your basic needs taken care of. It's nothing to aspire to, but it's going to exist. So again, all these people that think, oh, you know, the minimum wage needs to be increased, blah, blah, blah. You're just, you know, putting yourself in a position where you're going to be put out of work given a very basic income and robots or AI will take over your job because you're too lazy to work it for a nominal wage. Next question, how to break up with a woman in the least hurtful way? <laughs> oh, we care about everybody's feelings so much today, right? Very, very straightforward. Look, you know, you should be spinning plates, dating multiple women in a non-monogamous fashion. There's chicks that are going to catch feelings. They dig your vibe. They want to be with you. They want to claim you exclusively. You take a look at her. She's not a good fit. She's got 21 red flags. She's got more red flags than a Chinese communist parade. So you make the intelligent decision not to invite this chaos, this train wreck, this dumpster fire into your life to create chaos in it. You don't owe her anything more than I don't see a good fit for us on a long-term basis. Good luck. That's it. You don't need to sit down and have meetings with her. You don't have to have exchange emails or text messages, listen to her cry. That's it. That's all that you owe her. Don't ghost her. Don't be a, a prick and just block her number or something. I mean, look, if she's going getting crazy, you might have to get to that point. But just straightforward. I don't see a good fit for us on a long-term basis. I wish you the best of luck. Goodbye. That's it. And you cut her off. Uh, don't string her on. Don't lie to her. Don't play any other games with her. It's pretty straightforward. You shouldn't need to complicate this one. Next question. How do you keep a good woman long-term if you don't want to get married? I have a really amazing long-term girlfriend with only red flag, with only one red flag, which is she doesn't really know how to cook. She wants to get married, but I don't. And she is always badgering me about it. I don't know your ages, but here's the thing. A woman that sees you as her best option, okay, her hypergamous best option, she will abandon her entire sexual strategy to conform to yours. Okay, so if this guy's saying, I don't want to get married, I see the risk is too high, I'm not interested in having kids, but I like having a girlfriend, she's a good girlfriend, except for she doesn't know how to cook, which by the way, she can learn. I mean, if she, if she really digs your vibe, if she's got genuine burning desire, uh, tell her that culinary skills are important and I want you to take cooking classes. I, I, I want you to be able to prepare healthy meals for us, right? So that's one thing that you can bring up as well. The, the, the component of living with or marrying a woman that you don't want to live with or marry is actually very, very easy to handle. And this is the way that I would do it. You've been dating for a while, obviously. She's a good girlfriend. You like her. She digs your vibe. She's badgering you for marriage. Probably her family is badgering her, which might, in some regard, be badgering you. Maybe there's a little niece or nephew that comes over and says, hey, you know, why don't you want to marry Auntie blah 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 or whatever, right? And, you know, the little six-year-old, you got to pat him on the head and explain, well... Take a look around at everybody that's married and you tell me who's happy. That's usually the easiest way to, d to deal with it because it's, it's not often that a girl that you're dating in a long-term relationship, you've met her family, you've done the birthday parties, you've done the New Year's Eve, the Christmases, the Thanksgiving, and you start to get to know the family, right? You start to get to know the aunts, the uncles, the mom and dad, the cousins that are married. And then you can look around the entire spectrum and scope of everybody and be like, look at all these happy and love people that don't disparage each other, that are still intimate with each other on a frequent basis, multiple times per week. It just doesn't really happen. We know as a matter of fact, and I talked about this in my book, The Unplugged Alpha, again, that over time, women lose interest in a guy uh, considerably. It's like, you know, it's like a hockey stick. It, it, it drops pretty hard from, you know, the time when they start living together and or getting married. Whereas for guys, it's a, it's more of a longer tail that we lose interest, but we know statistically women lose interest faster than men do. 
So why would you want to ruin a relationship that you have a good time in? She loves you. You love her. Why would you want to ruin that relationship by living together or by getting married and living in a, like it's a broken institution. 50% of marriages end in divorce of the ones that stay together after eight years, only 13% are in a state of love and less than 2% are in a state of obsession, bliss, you know, with one another. It's not a very successful instrument, if you will. It is a very unsuccessful instrument that fails more often than not. So why would you want to take it on? It just doesn't make any sense. If you don't want kids and you don't see any uh, benefit to living with a gal or living in a way that looks like marriage, just say, no, I love you. I don't want to ruin what we have by getting married or, or living together. Oh, does that mean da, 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 are we ever just going to like, when is this ever going to change? It's so unromantic. Da, da, da. I didn't say never. Okay. Maybe at some time in the future, or if we move somewhere that's friendlier, you know, as, as, as far as family law goes, maybe we'll take a look at it then give her a little bit of hope. But as far as it stands, if you've made that conclusion today where you stand, it's probably not worth your while. And at least you've overtly stated to her what your position is. If she doesn't like that, the door is over there. It's always unlocked, but it will be locked if you try to walk back in it, right? Uh, never let a woman walk out of your life, go and share her body with a bunch of other dudes and then come back to you and be like, hey, I'm back. You know, can we try to make things work? No, you walked out the door. It's locked when you try to come back in. It's as simple as that. So you just set the terms of the relationship, it's men that are, that are the gatekeepers to the relationship and how the relationship operates. Maintain that frame. Set those boundaries and do it the way that you want to do it, not the way that she wants to do it. Far too many guys just go, well, if I don't marry her, she's just going to leave me and be with somebody else, right? That's a loser's mindset. That's a guy's mindset that doesn't have a lot of abundance. You have to be comfortable with a woman walking out of your life. It's, it's fine. And she has to know that she's replaceable, not overtly saying, bitch, I can replace you, but she has to know that you have options, okay, without you, again, overtly stating it. You don't need to make it, you know, rub stuff in her face, make her feel bad, but you get the idea, yeah? Next question. How do I get over my one-itis? I've been struggling. So if you're unfamiliar with one-itis, it's a unhealthy attachment to one woman. Generally, it looks like this. Guy and gal's dating. She starts to lose interest in him. She says something like, I need a break. I want to explore some options. I'm going to move across the country and go to school here for a bit, uh, sort of thing. And then he pines for her, right? He didn't want that relationship to end. She tried to do it in a nice way, you know, trying to be considerate for him sort of thing, but he's not getting the love and the intimacy and the reciprocation back that he's putting into her. So he gets one itis. It's very uncomfortable. Almost every guy has to go through it. It is a rite of passage from uh, moving from a male to a man. There's lots of adult males out there that become men when they go through one-itis. It's actually not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's going to shape you. It's going to get less painful as time goes on. I've been through it, been there, done it, got the t-shirt. I've pined for women that don't want me. Look in the mirror and say, good. What is my deficiency? Why did she want to leave me? Me of all people, why did she want to go off and explore thinking she's going to get better options? It's because you're not the best version of yourself. Go to the chapter in my book on the seven spokes of a high value man. Read it, reread it, understand it, do all of those things. If you want to be in a position where you say, bye, it's okay, I can replace you, you need to be that guy. The reason why you feel very uncomfortable and you have one itis right now, an unhealthy attachment to one woman, hoping that that will rekindle in the future, is because you don't have better options. It's because she thinks she has better options and she's probably exploring them while you're sitting there crying to yourself, I hope Becky comes back, I just love her so much, while she's getting her guts rearranged by some other dude. That's generally the way that it goes. Do not take these women back. Do not pine for her over a long-term basis. Grieve. Update your beliefs. Make sure you improve yourself. If you find yourself in a scenario where you're doing this for months or even years, that's a serious problem. Get help with that. The way in which you make decisions for your life is not working, is not serving you. Fix that. Fix the meatball between your ears. Again, the chapter on seven spokes of a high value man. There's no guy that's maxed out on the seven spokes that's wealthy, influential, successful, that's going to be sitting there crying in his exotic car over a girl that left him. He's just going to find a replacement and put her in the passenger seat and move on. Next question. Do I get a divorce? I've reread your book and the audio version accompanies me on my commute. Married 15 years this May. And I often think, what would Richard Cooper do if he were me? What would Richard do? Um, there's a book that I'm going to recommend if you're contemplating untying the knot. 
It's called Too Bad to Stay, Too Good to Leave. That's the title. I don't remember her full name, but the author's name, last name is Kirschenbaum or something like that. It's an older book. Uh, she took years of her practice and basically each chapter is a story of a couple's uh, untying or the unwinding of that relationship uh, from her practice. So, it, so it's got real pra pragmatic sort of like real life experiences. It's a book that I relied on when I was contemplating my own divorce. I found it very useful. I can't tell you straight up like what would Rich Cooper do. Look, it's gonna be dependent on how old are the kids, what kind of assets do you have? What does she do for a living? Is she a stay-at-home mom? Does she work? Where do you live in what state? Um, what's her relationship with the kids, your relationship with the kids? There's lots going on. If you want more help than just that, I have a course, it's called The Unplugged Alpha's Guide to Divorce. Uh, I put it together specifically for guys asking this question, should I get divorced and how to untie the knot? There's a lot of stuff in there that helps you planning um, so that you minimize losing your assets, minimize problems with uh, alienation of your kids from you, like her removing the kids from your lifestyle. Uh, there's lots of preventative steps that you have to understand because let's be honest, women initiate eight out of 10 uh, divorces and they're still getting the vast majority of the custody orders. And they also spend a lot of time planning this out as well too. So I think that if untying the knot is definitely in your near future, get the course. There's actually two modules. There's the there's a course component, which is pretty cheap. And then there's the Zoom calls as well, which is kind of like Q&A support for things that pop up along the way. But that's pinned in the description below. Last question. Rich, curious about your view on a matter. A woman was married for 24 years. 12 of it was bad. He lost interest, quit having sex with her altogether for 10 years due to drinking and porn. She cheated on him twice in the same year. She is now divorced. Is this woman safe to date? <sighs> so a chick's married for 24 years. So she stays committed to a man, but for 12 years of it, they're not banging. That is brings me to the question, why does he not want to have sex with her? Why is alcohol and porn more interesting than being intimate with a woman, a beauty object, let's be honest. And I can only go to, well, was she a beauty object? Was she disagreeable? Was she miserable to him? Was she, you know, she pack on the pounds, start putting on maximum density uh, as the years gone in the marriage and he wasn't interested in being with her. And then she steps out on the relationship and betrays him. Remember, Men cheat, women betray. A man can go out and cheat, have sex with a woman, come home, love his family, his kids, pay all the bills, still show up for Thanksgiving, for summer holidays, and do all of that stuff. For him, it can just be sex. But for women, when they step out, it is a betrayal because they, generally speaking, love the guy. They use it as a monkey branch, sort of like a switch out over to the next guy. Let's hold on to this safe object before we move on to the next safe object. There's no time in history where women have ever run a harem of men, where they've been in love with multiple men simultaneously. Women are serial monogamous, so it's usually one man at a time. Uh, whereas a man can have sex and just not even care about her or think about her forever after that and still, you know, be in love with his monogamous, you know, sort of partner. I'm going to use the word partner, but wife, you know, girlfriend, you know, whatever it happens to be. So to this point, is she, is she damaged? Sorry, is she safe to date was the question. I mean, look, man, she betrayed her commitment to her husband, not once, but twice, although he wasn't being intimate with her. We don't know the full story. You only, again, there's her side of the story, there's his side of the story, and then somewhere in the middle there, there's some truth, right? You're only getting her side of the story, and it's because she wants to date this guy and to be intimate with him. So she's trying to, you know, she's trying to convince him to sign up for a long-term relationship with her, which he's now questioning, is she a good match? Do my dude, my dude, if you're contemplating a relationship with a divorced woman, potentially has kids from her marriage that she cheated on twice, you, you've got a special degree of uh, value that you see yourself worth in that doesn't exist elsewhere. You think that she's not gonna cheat on you? You think she's not going to step out on you at some point and tell some other guy in the future, oh, he was mean to me. He was abusive. You know, he didn't, he didn't take care of me. He was addicted to porn and alcohol. It's going to be some version of some other story like that, that you're going to get, which is going to be problematic. So there's my final Q 
Q&A question. Anyway, I hope you guys found that useful. Leave a comment below. Check out the resources in the top pinned comment that I was talking about in this video for my book, the courses, and a bunch of other stuff. We'll see you guys in the next one. Have an amazing day. To the next 100,000, we'll get to 800,000. I'll do the same thing, another group Q&A. See you guys later. Peace out. I don't ever slow up. No, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, I'll always show up.